So I have something absolutely insane to share with you. A new report from CIBC says that we may have been undercounting the population of Canada by up to 1 million people. And the organization that's responsible for doing this counting just said, uh, oopsie, yeah, we might have done that. And this has a huge impact on every single Canadian because population numbers are largely used to forecast how much demand there will be for different goods and services and as a result the costs of those goods and services and more importantly the amount of housing that we need both now and to project into the future. And now when questioned about it, the government is blaming a 20 to 30 billion dollar per year industry for making the problem way worse and actually trying to profit by gaming the system. So let's get into why this happened, uh, how it happened, and who's clearly standing to gain from the situation. This is a report that was released just yesterday by CBC, specifically written by Benjamin Tal, who's kind of like their top macroeconomic analyst. In it, he says that the official number of non-permanent residents that is widely quoted and used for planning purposes undercounts the actual number of non-permanent residents in Canada uh, by close to 1 million people, and this happens uh, because of a, a couple different factors. The first problem is because of the numbers that Stats Canada, the government agency that's supposed to be monitoring population, uh, this number that they choose to use. Now, in the past, they've used the uh, census that comes around every few years to determine how many non-permanent residents there are. But they also use a second, more frequently updated number, one that's actually updated every three months, um, that's made up of a bunch of different projections that sort of says, hey, based on all this other information we have, uh, what's the amount of non-permanent residents in Canada as of this quarter of the year, every three months. This quarterly data is seen as a lot more accurate because, well, a lot of not permanent residents in Canada don't actually fill out the census, uh, whether it's because they're here as students and don't feel like it's something that they need to fill out, or if the instructions are unclear when it's mailed out to wherever they're living. For a number of different reasons, there's many uh, non-permanent residents that don't fill out the census. So it ends up being that these quarterly demographic stats are a lot more accurate, in at least Stats Canada's eyes. But for whatever reason, Stats Canada has chosen to use the census data when uh, counting the population rather than the seen as more accurate demographic stat statistics um, that are produced quarterly. Now, there is a large gap between the number that they think is more accurate and the number that they use, right? We can see back in 2001, the gap wasn't that large because, well, there weren't a lot of non-permanent residents comparatively to today, where there is a far larger amount of of non-permanent residents, which sort of amplifies that gap between the census data and the more accurate demographic statistics um, so much. Uh, you can see this, this gap right here. It's around 250,000 Canadians that are undercounted. And that data is as of 2021, the year before the highest number of uh, non-permanent residents, uh, around 900,000 to a million um, are the, the official estimates. But okay, 250,000 people, that's not a million. I thought you said that we were overcounting by a million. But wait, there is more. It gets even crazier because of a weird assumption that's made by Stats Canada. Well, it seems like there's an additional 750,000 non-permanent residents being conservative that aren't being counted in Canada's population. In the report, Benjamin Tal says Statistics Canada's system assumes that temporary residents, um, these non-permanent resident visa holders, uh, leave the country every time after 30 days um, after their visa expires. But in reality, the majority of those temporary residents don't leave after their visas expire. Now this could be for any number of reasons. It could be because they're planning on applying for permanent residency. About 60% of international students say that they're planning on going this route. Um, additionally, many are also waiting for an invitation via the express entry program, um, and they stay a while while they're waiting for this uh, invitation. If you're not familiar, the express entry program is a program that's designed to bring in new Canadians to the country more frequently if they have work experience that's valued here in Canada, that if they're filling roles that we, we see as necessary, it's kind of like a point system where based off of the skills you have and the work experience you have, you uh, are either invited into the program or denied. 
So some people stay a little longer after their visas expire, hoping that they're going to get this invitation into the express entry program. And if they stay a little while longer, it might give them time to process and, and get those points to uh, get into this program. Uh, now, Tal goes on and says, there's no known administrative action by IRCC, that's Immigration and Refugee Canadian Citizenship, uh, to remove these expired visa holders from Canada, nor is there any way to withdraw their employment or tax slip issuances from the Canadian Canada Revenue Agency. So Stats Canada is assuming that after every single visa expires that people just leave the country and it's fine, but Tal here is saying that there's actually no way to guarantee that those folks have left after their visas expire, and actually in the majority of cases, people simply end up waiting a little while longer, either trying to apply for permanent residency or, or just becoming a, a citizen via the Express Entry Program. In the report, Tal makes some assumptions, but he says, okay, between 2017 and 2022, assuming no Nobody overstayed in the years prior to that, well, we'd have north of 750,000 people who have overstayed uh, without having a visa. So 250,000 with the gap from the census data and 70, 750,000 of uncounted folks who have overstayed their visa length, well, we get an additional 1 million people that Stats Canada just simply hasn't counted and added to the Canadian population. And this has a big impact on Canadians. Uh, it be by understanding the population that impacts the housing and the service demand that we can expect uh, in our country, as well as makes the housing affordability crisis and the sort of projections of, oh, we need to build, build 5 million homes in the next 10 years to, to restore affordability. Well, even those projections are coming in too low because we're undercounting our population. And a spokesperson for Stats Canada, the folks who have miscounted by Benjamin Tal's reports, comes out and says, uh, well, actually, our stats on non-permanent residents are accurate, and they're produced using robust mechanisms, and in collaboration with many stakeholders, you've got nothing to worry about. But that starts to smell a little bit fishy when you go down here and look at this next statement, saying, um, starting September 27th, actually, we're going to publish new data on the NPRs, and uh, we're going to publish that data and compute it using a revised methodology, using a, a new counting mechanism for determining how many non-permanent residents are in the country. It seems a little bit fishy that this statement comes out just a day after Benjamin Tal releases this report. Uh, their statement is, everything's fine, we've been counting things right, but also we're going to change the way we show you the data and the way that we count things um, to produce that data that we show you in these tables starting next month. It seems like Tal was on the right track here and uh, well is that Stats Canada has uh, grossly underreported the amount of Canadians that, that exist in the country. This also has a large impact on rental demand for, for rental housing right especially in university towns and cities, college towns and cities um, where many of these international students who make up a large portion of these non-permanent residents um, are living right to live close to school. Now uh, uh, this uh, influx of rental demand actually bleeds over into the whole ownership problem that we have. Uh, listen to this. This was from the Liberals' federal cabinet retreat where they actually invited housing experts to, hey, tell us what we're doing wrong here. Uh, this was an interesting clip from Mike Moffat. The subdivision I grew up in, in, in London, Ontario, I spent the first 11 years of my life in this neighborhood. Uh, it's about six and a half kilometers from Fanshawe College. It's not, it's not even that close. When I grew up there, every house had young kids in it. Every, every house had families. Now that, that neighborhood is getting turned into a sea of student rentals. So what, what this rental crisis is causing is this bleeding into an ownership crisis. It's that the, the, the 2023 version of my parents in 1970 can't buy those homes because what's, they're competing against ca investors who are well capitalized who are turning these into student rentals. So when there's so much demand for rental housing and not enough stock of it, investors can buy homes and rent them out um, legally or illegally, perhaps by the room, increasing the rents that they can get on each of these houses, meaning that they increase the return and increase the amount that they can feasibly pay for it uh, and actually uh, be cash flow positive, right? Now, as a result of this, well, uh, people are competing against investors in neighborhoods where previously it was very family focused. Listen to me when I say this. If you're someone who's watching this and is saying, oh, we, we, are, we should blame the international students. They are the problem. They shouldn't be here in this country. 
you're missing the point of what I'm saying here. It's not an international student's fault that they were allowed into the country via some of these programs that are perfectly legal and perfectly accessible to them. It's not their fault that we don't have the supply that we need in these communities surrounding these schools that they are attending through fully legal means, right? This is a failure on the part of both the provincial and the federal government. And if you think that this is anything about a race or, or, or not wanting new Canadians in the country, you've definitely missed the mark on what I'm trying to say here. It's a failure of both governments and certain private universities who are making this situation worse for the sole purpose of profiting. Um, you can see here um, there was an interview with Mark Miller, who's the immigration minister for Canada, and he talks about this 20 to 30 Canadian uh, or billion dollar in Canadian dollars industry that is international students in Canada. Uh, listen to this clip uh, I'm going to show you here from an interview with Mark Miller where he says, okay, uh, there are some people that we need to target here because they're making things worse and exploiting it to, to make themselves rich. The international student program is something that has tripled to something in and around what we're trending for as about 900,000 international students this year, we're currently at 800,000. It is uh, an ecosystem in Canada that is very lucrative and it's come with some perverse effects, uh, some fraud in the system, some people taking advantage of what is seen to be a backdoor entry into, into Canada. My concern as the Minister of Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship is with the integrity of the system and what we've seen as with any sort of lucrative uh, economic proposition, this one in from 20 to $30 billion, is uh, that there are, there are some people making a lot of money out of it, legitimately some people gaming the system. And my principal concern is, uh, is with that integrity of the system. And in previous videos, we've talked about these diploma mill uh, pop-up uh, sort of strip mall type universities that are just trying to pump more and more international students through their doors, even if there isn't adequate classroom sizes or adequate housing in the area, as long as they can get them to pay that sweet, sweet double tuition, well, it's fine by them, right? This is a big issue. And it's one that Mark Miller here, the immigration minister says, hey, that, that's something that I'm going to focus on. There are people making money on this legitimately, but then there's the more shady side of things. But all in all, I just had to tell you about this because I think it's absolutely wild that we just hit 40 million in our population as Canada when that number actually could be 41 or more if it was undercounted in years prior. Um, it has a big impact on housing, a big impact on a lot of the projections and of the way the country's going to go. Now, I'm curious what you think about all of this. Uh, do you think that it's the immigration program's fault or do you think that there's some other culprit here that I'm missing? H have I hit the nail on the head or uh, have I gotten things totally wrong? wrong. You're welcome here. Either way, let me know what you think down in the comments. Subscribe to this channel if you haven't already done so. And with all of that said, thanks so much for watching everyone. I really hope this video helped you out at least a little bit and I'll see you next time.